Hi, and welcome everybody. Um, Kelly, are we ready to go your side? I see the number of participants yes. is increasing. Yes. So we're live. Okay, great. Hi everybody, and welcome to Rare Diseases South Africa webinar, where we're going to be looking at insights and in dealing with trauma related to cleft and craniofacial during lockdown, a combined medical and parent approach. So we're really excited to have so many people online and a real amazing lineup that we have tonight with the speakers that we have. And we're gonna kick straight off. Um, we're gonna kick off with Professor Tim Christofides. He is a pediatric plastic surgeon um, who is based at a number of places. He works, he's practicing both at Sunning Hill Hospital and Morningside Clinic as a fully qualified plastic surgeon, but he also works at Charlotte Makeke um, or Joburg Gen Academic Hospital, where he's very involved in the training up of registrars who are basically training to become plastic surgeons. Um, he has been trained by really renowned experts throughout the world, both in South Africa and the UK, um, where he's been trained by um, Professor Saris, Professor Chait, Professor Wid Widgero, and it seems that all plastic surgeons have very difficult surnames. But we're really excited for him to speak. Um, if you want to read more about him, you can read the biography that's on the invitation for this webinar. And he's gonna be talking about challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic relating to surgeries. And we're gonna have a short talk and then we're gonna have an opportunity for questions. So please, if you have questions that come up or arise as he's talking, please just drop them in the Q&A or put your comments in the chat and let's try and make this as interactive as possible. So it's a real opportunity to really pick the mind of Prof now. So without any further ado, please go ahead and let's get started with the first talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for this op um, great opportunity. It is a very difficult time that we're going through and um, specifically for uh, these particular children that uh, need surgeries like cleft lip and palate and craniofacial. And um, I'll just, um, you know, it's difficult to pitch this, uh, this talk when there's both medical and lay uh, public um, and parents um, of these children that, um, that are listening. So I just want to highlight a few points. It's not to, not to be a didactic lecture on how we do cleft lip and palate or anything like that. But I'll kick, kick straight into it. Um, and uh, um, we can then uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about everything afterwards. So essentially, we're looking at uh, um, basically cle clefts and COVID-19. Like I said, it's actually a very difficult scenario that we're actually going through. Now, very briefly, just something about clefts. It's very important, and this goes for craniofacial surgery as well, but it's very important to understand that um, clefts are, are dealt with, um, the management is dealt with by a multidisciplinary team. So everybody's holding the patient up, and it's a number of people, and one is not more important than the other. It's very important to understand that. One thing that we must really understand, the person that we actually forget is um, the parent or the guardian, and I put this person over here as um, the parent and the guardian actually holding the patient up. The rest of us are just um, there to assist in specific areas. And like I said, no one is um, more important than the next. We're all there. This is no, in no particular order. It's um, just uh, how it is. Just a quick picture of a before and after to make it more interesting. Again, you know, there's the obvious deformity of a cleft lip and a palate. The facial deformity is there to see, and as plastic surgeons, we often um, uh, really only look at that, and sometimes we are blinded by everything else and look at our results. But there are feeding problems associated, there are speech problems that um, come about because of the cleft lip and palate, and um, the ear must not be forgotten. There's recurrent ear infections that occur all the time, and this can lead to hearing loss and so on. But very importantly, there's the psychological issues of cleft lip and palate. These children and all, you know, they grow up with a very poor self-esteem in many situations. This is not in every case, but many situations. They've got a very secluded lifestyle and their behavior is very secluded. 
um, intellectual disabilities can occur, learning disabilities can occur, they often suffer anxiety disorders as well as depression. And this is all evidence-based. I'm not making this up. You can look this up and I've got the literature to back it up. And in fact, the list goes on. So in our scenario, uh, the things that I've just mentioned, we've got our physical deformity, the obvious deformity that we are dealing with. And then we've got the psychological issues. Now you can imagine what the outcome is going to be if these are not dealt with correctly. However, in addition to that, we don't live in a perfect world in South Africa. And we have got something that cannot be ignored, which is the socioeconomic issues as well. These socioeconomic issues, um, like I say, cannot be ignored. The patient needs to get to the clinics. They need to get to speech therapy, the psychologist, the ENT, and so on and so on. So uh, if you add that in as well, again, the outcome can be very poor if everybody is not playing their role. Just a quick before and after again. So the management is exceptionally sensitive for these children. We've got a multidisciplinary team and then we have the patient as well as the parent and the guardian. Now, you know, a part cannot truly hate that which makes it whole. So I'm not saying that um, we, we, anyone here hates each other. I'm just saying that without working together and properly, um, the, the management of a cleft child is not going to be effective. In addition to that, the management of clefts is actually time sensitive as well. And again, this is evidence-based. The cleft lip, we usually deal with and um, operate on at three months and the cleft palate, we do at nine months. And then there's many other surgeries that will um, need to um, take place, which, which occur at um, uh, different times and almost up to adulthood. So, um, um, that's very important. The cleft uh, palate at nine months is important. They, you want to operate on the child, um, child's palate for speech purposes at that time. And if it's delayed, it may be affected. Again, another quick uh, before and after to make uh, this interesting. But at this particular time, coronavirus came along and a cleft lip and palate has been deemed to be a high risk procedure for a number of reasons, which I'll go into a bit later. All surgeries have been stopped, um, and the backlash of that has been quite quite immense. So now, if we delay a cleft lip and palate surgery by three or four months, in actual fact, there's very little influence on the outcome for the patient. Um, it just does put a little bit uh, more uh, pressure on an already overburdened system. But if we delay the, um, um, the surgery by more than four months, you may start developing um, uh, further problems, specifically with the palate. The speech may be delay, delayed even further. Um, more resources may be required. In other words, that the child may learn to speak properly eventually, but it'll require more intensive speech therapy, more visits to the speech therapist. So in other words, everything is going to be sort of doubled. Um, there will be increased psychological issues, both for the parents as, as well as the child. And the major backlog um, and pressure on the system will result in a system which cannot actually cope because it's um, a, a spiral that is never ending. So what do we know about uh, coronavirus and clefts? Well, in fact, it's very little because this is a new um, entity altogether. Um, the, the evidence is growing every day. However, we don't really know very much at the moment. What we do know is that cleft children are not really at more risk of getting the virus. However, we don't really know if uh, once they do get the virus, if they actually do, um, if they will display um, more illness, um, become more sick, because a lot of clefts are associated, have associated other comorbidities, maybe cardiac or anything else. Up to 30% of clefts have um, comorbid illnesses. So we don't really know that fact yet. Um, so for parents and everything else, it's normal to feel scared um, and when there's such major change. We, I did mention that it's a, a classified as a high risk procedure because it's very aerosolizing in theater and um, the anesthetists are quite concerned about that. Um, there's a lot of um, washout that occurs. We were operating in an area directly uh, contaminated with the coronavirus 
and when we do wash there's a lot of little droplets that get spread out so there's risk to the patient and there's also risk to the staff which is very important to understand so um, um, because of that reason cleft lip and palate repair has been stopped worldwide um, this is in first world countries um, as well as everywhere else it's all been uh, put on hold when will it commence um, it hasn't commenced in a lot of the first world countries either as yet. In uh, the UK, they haven't started yet, um, uh, nor in, in, uh, in, in America. So we shouldn't feel too bad. It'll only start once it's safer for all, once the resources are available, uh, where we've got adequate uh, uh, personal protective equipment, when there's theater availability and so on. As I mentioned, surgical delays well, for the cleft lip, there's very little impact. We can actually operate on a cleft lip between, you know, at any age. Other than the psychological issues associated, the repair is the same. Um, exposed teeth will become dry and decay, but um, we can always um, uh, deal with that. The cleft palate, however, is a bit of a problem. So speech development is essential. Ear infections will continue and there will be hearing loss um, and learning disabilities in the long term. Um, our results are not bad when we look at them uh, at a later age, even with the lip. This is a six-year-old boy, this is a 10-year-old girl, just a quick, uh, um, another picture. So what do we do now? Okay, so we've got a situation currently where we are not operating and what should we do later when we can operate again? Currently, we need to be looking at the major backlog to assess what the backlog is, prioritize our patients, and maybe seek help from uh, non-government organizations and so on, because our system is already under so much pressure. Patient care, we need to provide advice to the parents. We need to reassure parents. We need to um, um, try and get speech and, and other treatment, uh, non-surgical treatments, uh, protocols um, um, in place. And we, we need to continue the non-surgical uh, management where possible and continue seeing the patients where possible according to the rules and regulations of the government in lockdown. When surgery is allowed, we've got to now deal with this major backlog. So how do we do this? Obviously, we want to start um, uh, with the operations with the prioritized patients who have been delayed in a big way that are uh, time sensitive and so on. We also need to increase the numbers. Now, this is where the major issue comes up. Um, will uh, non-government organizations help? Will they help? They have in the past, and I'm sure they can um, um, in the future. The Smile Foundation has really assisted us in many, many ways um, in the past, and I'm sure that we can come to some form of um, um, an agreement or assistance where we can increase numbers because that is what we essentially need to do. We have got such a backlog already. Perhaps private institutions will come to the party and assist us um, in allowing us to do um, the operations in private institutions so we can increase numbers. I don't know. These are all suggestions. Um, patient care. We need to also um, continue as per normal, but also the healthcare provider, the speech therapist, the doctors seeing patients, um, we need to try and get other um, assistance. In other words, try and maybe, um, now, you know, with this backlog, the speech therapist, for example, is going to require, is going to need to see so many more patients at the, in the same amount of time. So can we get the parents' assistance with that? Can we do, uh, get some protocols in place and so on? So this is a very trying time for all of us and i think that at this stage of the game i'm not going to harp on it it's more of a an unknown territory to everybody it's not just um this is the solution i wish i had the solution unfortunately we don't we'll need to work together and uh, try and find a solution i know that a lot uh, a lot of people have asked about um how to apply the tape on a um on a, a little child um and i have got a video um, that that um, does show that. Um, I'm going to just start off uh, with this one because this is something that um, this is the type of tape that we in in uh, first world countries they've got very specialized tapes, but this is a very very simple tape that we cut into a strip of three and we can actually do that.
Yeah, clearly that's not a uh, clear patient. I just drew it in just to show you. So that's kind of like how we do that. If, um, if we have time later, I'll show you this video as well. But that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I think your, your passion and your honesty and really came through in your talk there. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come up um, from Hillary who is, she's essentially asked um, if you could just give a little bit of information about that. And she's also asking about the difference between cleft lip and palate. So I'm thinking maybe if you could just expand potentially, you know, what comorbidities would be um, combined with cleft in terms of syndromes and maybe multi malformations um she's and she's asking about the genetics and the you know the environmental component as well okay well sure that's quite a question um the the truth of the matter is that most of our children do get referred to well um we we do have a genetics department where um a lot of the children will need to get seen by a geneticist if um, there is a syndrome involved. Cleft lip and palate can happen um, without any, uh, as a sporadic condition, it doesn't have to have um, be involved or associated with a syndrome, but there are many, many, there's over 150 syndromes that uh, cleft lip and palate can occur with. Um, there's absolutely no time at this particular time to go through through all of them or anything like that but the point about it is that um, uh, cleft lip and palate can occur there's certain environmental conditions that will increase it um, um, but uh, it's dur during the pregnancy it's within the first eight weeks of pregnancy that this is um, um, going to um, reveal itself but um, some syndromes do have a cleft lip and palate and we can talk about that i did put my email address up we i can try and answer those in a bit more detail um, if need be now the difference between a cleft lip and a cleft palate is simply as the name infers the one is a a gap in the lip and the one is a gap in the palate they can occur in isolation and they can actually occur together so um oftentimes the, the, the palate is the, is the part on top of your mouth. Um, uh, it assists in speech and swallowing and feeding, etc. And the lip is literally your, your lip as you saw in those pictures. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks very much, Prof. And I know that um, some of the um, participants online, we've got a few medical geneticists online and genetic counsellors, so they can always provide some more information on the chat if they feel so inclined. Um, another question, there's some interest in the tape that you were using. Um, someone's got a baby whose nostril is quite flat and they're already struggling to breathe. Um, is there a particular tape? And there's also a question from the same person um, asking if it's bad for a baby with a cleft lip to suck on a dummy. Okay. Um... First of all, with the tape, the tape that we usually use is um, something called Blenderm tape. Um, uh, so B-L-E-N-D-E-R-M, -E Blenderm. Now, it's a tape that's quite difficult to get hold of. Um, it has got a bit of a stretch to it and, it, and that's what makes it effective. If you cannot get hold of that tape, um, micropore tape or, or transport tape will actually do the job, but not as well. Regarding the flat um, uh, um, uh, nose and everything, 
I can tell you that majority of um, um, cleft children have got a collapsed um, nose. And in actual fact, um, it's very, it's, it's unlikely that this will um, make it very difficult for the child to actually breathe. Um, if, if placed correctly, it, it can look uncomfortable. The children can um, appear to be in a little bit of distress and everything else, but it's very unlikely that they are. So keep at it. It's unlikely that they will um, not be able to breathe with this. Um, as far as a dummy goes, um, any pacifier or dummy, um, what we don't want, it's not a bad thing while they have a cleft, but after we do a cleft palate surgery, uh, we don't allow them to, to use dummies or anything because the dummy goes directly on top of the repair, in which case it will cause breakdown of our sutures and our repair, which is a, a bit of a disaster. So no bottles, no dummies, etc. So if you could wean off the dummy before the surgery, it's ideal. If you had a choice of whether to use one or not, don't, because we don't want you to use it after the repair. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions, but I think it's highly likely that more questions will come up through the other talks. So um, we'll probably move on to the other, um, um, the other speakers now, but please stay online so that we can analyze at the end. But thank you very much for a really informative talk. We've had a lot of positive feedback on the such as yourself online and available also us after the the webinar so we can keep sending you those questions um, I'm going to introduce our second speaker now um, and sorry Tim mute and I'm going to ask Helena Cullis our next speaker just to go on to so Helena Cullis is the founder and the national coordinator of Clef Friends which is a project of the Smile Foundation. Um, she's got a very interesting setup. She's coming to us from a, a small holding where she's got two children, two horses, two dogs, and one cat. Um, she's originally from Zimbabwe, um, but what changed her world with regards to orofacial cleft was on the 14th of May, 2009, when her son, Joel, was born with a cleft palate. It was a roller coaster of emotions and worry. Um, and after his surgery in 2009, she joined forces with a friend of hers, Madge Blignote, who was also born with a cleft lip and a palate, and together they started Cleft Friends. And it was clear to them from the beginning that there was a gap in South Africa where mothers really needed to connect with others that were also affected um, through having a child with a cleft lip and palate or themselves as a patient. And they really got a lot of support from the UK organization that really helped Alina to set up the South African Parent Support Group. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Helena, who is going to be talking about closing the gap for parents. Thanks, Helena. Thank you so much, Helen. It's a privilege to be here tonight. And I just wanna say thank you to Prof. Tim Christofides. I, I really hope that the, the parents who are on this, this chat and watching know how privileged they are to to have you available to speak to them. Um, today I'm talking about closing the gap for parents and about cleft friends. And I think during this international pandemic with COVID, we were all asked globally to use the hashtags, we're in this together, hashtag human connection, hashtag be kinder. And I'm proud to say that this, these are the values that, that cleft friends already has and that that every single month is cleft lip and palate awareness month for us, not just July. My story, you've heard a little bit of it from Helen, um, how we began. I had no idea my child uh, would be born with a cleft palate. He has a picture of, of um, the, you know, before he was born and with him feeding on the special needs bottle. And we did what every a uh, parent is told not to do. We went to Dr. Google and we searched for cleft uh, palate support in South Africa and we only found overseas information and we felt alone. So as Helen said, there was a clear need. 
Here's some pictures of uh, little Joel when he had his surgery at six months old. His biggest battle has actually been with grommets and um, he loves playing rugby. He's 11 years old now and he's happy and healthy and cheeky. And I've included this slide here on purpose. On the far right, you see our daughter. She um, came running into the lounge one day with a clothes peg on her lip and said, Mommy, look, I've got a cleft lip. And I thought, oh my word, these kids don't miss a beat. You know, um, they're watching all the time. And Joel, the odd thing is that Joel was born with a cleft palate, but she associated that. So siblings matter. Okay, friends, in 2009, Dr. Hayden Velardi from Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital allowed us to put a treatment of cleft lip and palate onto our website, which is how we started, because we already knew from the very beginning that we're parents, we're not medical professionals, and we can only speak from our lived experience. We, in 2010, engaged with Clapper in the UK, who were incredibly encouraging and guided us. And in 2012, we became a project of Smile Foundation. And this is beautiful Madge, who is the co-founder of Cleft Friends. And interesting that um, this is the only picture she has of when she was um, a baby. She doesn't have a before picture, and she's in her 40s now. So. Smile Foundation, um, we became a project of Smile and we augmented into the services in the academic hospitals, which was a perfect fit and really did make sense. We developed a training for support moms with a clinical psychologist. And in 2017, we rebranded Cleft Friends, um, established the model for Cleft Friends and established our vision and mission statement. As you can see this beautiful puppet here, this is Jackalaya. She's an absolute ray of sunshine, and uh, she's getting ready for her alveolar bone graft surgery. And our vision and mission with Cleft Friends is to improve lives by empowering, advocating, and educating all South Africans affected by cleft lip and palate. And our edge really is that we speak from a lived experience. Um, we have mom-to-mom -mom support, and we encourage bonding with babies. Very often, um, a mom is in shock, they go through grief, they don't know they're going through grief, and they feel robbed from the experience of breastfeeding, they feel robbed from people coming in and saying congratulations when people actually come in and gasp and say, what happened? And there's a lot of grief and an emotional side of the cleft journey that they go through. So we listen, then we empower new moms. And our strength really does lie in the support of medical professionals where we have certain plastic surgeons who will send us a WhatsApp connecting us with new moms. We have speech therapists who do the same. And when we're able to bring the parents together in the same communities, it really is an amazing opportunity. So the life cycle of a parent or patient within Clef Friends, we create awareness through three main channels. We use um, online, we use word of mouth, and then there are medical professionals. We have a referral process. And the next step really does, steps depend on where a patient lives. If they're in Cape Town, we then connect them with a the support mom in Cape Town. If they're in KwaZulu-Natal, we connect them with a the support mom in, in KZN, et cetera. So our services include one-on-one -on -one support, hospital visitation, which is clearly paused during lockdown, informative resources, and we have a closed Facebook group on called Cleft Moms SA, and as well as regional WhatsApp groups and uh, community events. So our community events this uh, year, because of COVID, has taken the form of online events, and uh, we are we are meeting the need and connecting with parents during this time. So our direct social impact, we have affected more than 750 uh, families since 2009. Our support moms report feeling useful, confident, and they appreciate learning new and transferable skills. Where we are in touch with adults and adolescents diagnosed with a cleft condition, they report feeling um, more able to engage with their lives as well as feeling an increased positive sense of themselves and an increased mental health. So our innovation really uh, was, we worked really hard on a, on a cleft lip and palate parent guide that was South African. We connected with medical professionals who gave their input because when a parent is given information, there 
immediately that it's information they can trust. Like it's not something you've looked up on, on Facebook that's not accredited. It alleviates that stress and anxiety because there are questions that we're able to use to, to ask your specific medical professional um, questions that relate to your baby. As every we've learned, every cleft lip and palate is different. We have the honor of having Lynette Dean as our oversight, our clinical advisory. She's a counseling psychologist. So she oversees the training of our support moms and makes sure that we remain within the ethical bounds of what her clinical license does. And um, she takes good care of us. And then I'm very proud of this slide. These are our moms all over the country. Aren't they just beautiful? And as you can see, some of them have various um, and other medical conditions, not just cleft lip and palate, although cleft lip and palate is what brings us all together. We have a mom who had a baby with trisomy. We've got a mommy blogger. They, like Prof said, that there are over 150 other syndromes related to cleft lip and palate. Um, we have just seen that naturally come about um, through different, different um, conditions. Our support mom's reach um, goes into the Eastern Cape, Gauteng, Western Cape, KZN, and Pumalanga, and Free State. And we are always looking for opportunities to grow and connect with new moms who feel that they want to give back and be that, that ray of hope to a new mommy in their area going through what they've gone through. Our growth, as I said before, we've, we've reached out to over 750 families. We've got 29 support moms. We've got 14 WhatsApp groups. So you really don't want to be on my phone. And um, they are always buzzing. And there are good positive chats going on. And we really do encourage parents to ask their medical professionals questions. But sometimes it really does help to pop on a group when you're feeling anxious about something. And you've got a mom who who is just ahead of you or way ahead of you on the cleft journey, who's able to just ground you and, and give you good advice. We have over 382 participants on these WhatsApp groups. And we've got on our cleft moms essay, we've got 400 members. And the exciting thing about cleft friends is that our model is being used for, to start another support group, which is a very, very exciting endeavor. During lockdown, um, the top five themes on our various chat groups have been cleft surgeries um, and the anxi anxiety experienced um, by our parents uh, due to dates being moved to lockdown. I can say that uh, we have successfully been able to um, refer parents to different um, psychologists in their areas with the help of Smile Foundation who have funded that and it really has helped uh, in tremendously. Parenting tips due to lockdown, feeding, general health care and post-op care have been the top uh, themes on, on our chat groups. During lockdown, we took the opportunity uh, to present an online series called Overcoming Trauma. We titled it Titanic Series. And this really did point out the grieving curve um, that all of us experience. And I think just the whole world has experienced during COVID. And these sessions are available on the Smile Foundation YouTube channel if anybody wants to refer back to them. And it breaks down the different stages of grief. And then last night we had speech therapist Georgia Jameen on Cleft Friends Live and she was an absolute delight. And it was a great opportunity for parents as well to connect. And on Thursday, we've got uh, Dr. Chris Van Avalt, who will also be chatting on the Cleft Friends pages. So that's one way we've, we've reached out on our platforms during lockdown. And thank you, that's me. Great, thank you so much, Helena. Um, again, your passion is really coming through. And I mean, I met you a number of years ago just to see how much you've grown and just how the outreach of Cleft Friends has just expanded. 750 on your database and 14 WhatsApp groups. That's, that's huge. I mean, I think if we ever got you and Kelly in a room again with your WhatsApp groups, it would, yeah, it would explode. But thank you so much. Um, it's just been amazing to hear how you've grown. Um, as an organization and um, we have got some questions that have come through on the Q&A. I think several of them are actually for Prof um, related to kind of some technical 
um, clinical or surgical issues. Um, so there is one comment that's come up on the, the chat is about the need to improve online resources for facial differences for patients and caregivers and parents. Now, is it still the case that um, do cleft friends just cover, cover clefts and Smart Foundation cover some of the other facial differences or do you include them in your patient support as well? Well, I think that is the, the exciting thing about the future that those resources will be available through Smile Foundation, but Clef Friends is specifically Clef Lip and Palette. Okay. Okay. And of all the challenges that have come up through this COVID-19 season and the pandemic, what has been the number one issue for people that are in your, for your, for your members that are in the community? I think, uh, Helen, it really does relate to the number one issue of COVID in general. It's the unknown. It's that, that not knowing the waiting period, is, this, is waiting an extra month going to affect my child's speech later in life? Are they going to battle because they've had to wait? The, the anxiety really has been the biggest, biggest battle. Okay. Okay. If anybody has more questions for Helena, please drop them in the Q&A or in the chat and we will invite all the panel, panelists on again to respond to them at the end. But thank you very much, Helena, for your really informative talk. Um, I'm hoping that we can all get a hold of your PowerPoint presentations and share them with everybody and all the attendees afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank and you. we're going to move on to our last speaker, who is Sylvia Mchunu. I do hope I'm pronouncing it right. We didn't have a chance to clarify that at the beginning. So Sylvia is going to be talking as a mother of a daughter with cleft lip and palate. And she's also the coordinator of the Hauteng region for Smile Foundation. So a big welcome to Sylvia. She's originally from Daviton, but in Benoni, but she's now living in Germiston. She's a proud wife and mother to five beautiful children. I thought three were a handful, but five, goodness me. Um, and she is a person that lives and embraces life with a spirit of love and gratitude. Her daughter, Princess, who is now seven, was born with a bilateral cleft and palate. And as a result of her personal access support mum for Claire Friends, um, where she's really blossomed and she now connects with new parents and welcomes them in the Hauteng region, in Swanee, in Limpopo and KZN WhatsApp groups, so that they can connect with other parents of children that have been affected. She tries to be a calming influence on the new mums and encourages them to keep asking questions and just to keep loving her babies. So I'd just like to hand over to Sylvia now, um, and she's gonna talk about a lived experience. So thank you very much, Sylvia. Sorry, Sylvia, we can't hear you. Can you unmute, please? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, I, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Helena, and thank you to, good evening to all the moms who are watching, and it's a great pleasure to be on the first panel, especially with Helena and Prof. Christophidis. Uh, the day Princess was born, it was a good day. Everybody was looking forward to a new member in the family. Already I had three kids by then, of which we were expecting a baby boy, but unfortunately, I had a baby girl. So Princess was born in hospital in Jameson, Better Girl Hospital, whereby I didn't know anything about cleft lip and palate. The only shock I had was the day I received the news that Princess is born with cleft lip and palate, of which I didn't know. But there was a doctor in Jameson Hospital who helped me. And especially the nurses there, they were also shocked after I had Princess because 
I think they were not sure what's happening. Then suddenly they showed me the face for Princess, which was so emotional. I remember crying the whole day. Then there was a doctor who helped me. That's Dr. Kola from, uh, Dr. Kola from Jameson Hospital, then explained to me what happened to Princess. Then he counseled and comforted me and told me, everything is going to be okay. There are kids out there who looks like just like princess. Then I couldn't understand because I asked myself already, I had three kids, the burn normal, then what happened to this one? Then it was time when I had to tell princess and the siblings and my husband as well, notifying them that I just delivered a baby boy, a baby girl, but there is something wrong with her face. So imagining going back home to explain to her siblings what's wrong with the baby. But what I liked most by the time I was in my husband was so supportive, even though he hasn't seen Princess. Then the whole family is so supportive. They love their sister. And you know, Princess became part of the project because even at school, whenever they are doing projects, it's all about princess. So they're doing show and tells, telling all the friends, you know, educating everyone about the condition for princess. So everybody's so supportive. Yes, it did affect the family, but at the end of the day, they love princess. The whole family love princess. So there's nothing wrong with princess. She's still our princess. One other thing, some family members, They were trying, like, commenting on saying, like, the baby born like this is witchcraft. Some of them, they were sad during pregnancy. So, for me, yes, she is different because of her condition, but she's still my princess and she's still beautiful. So, people will look at you, especially when I used to take her for antenatal clinic they'll be asking questions some of them will be shaked but i normally teach people everywhere i go i remember i used to carry my cell phone with me whoever was asking and looking i'll explain what happened to my baby so in any way i just feel like princess condition uh, condition has helped me a lot in educating more people because especially in our communities people they don't know about this condition some of them, whenever you're starting to train or educate them, they then understand. Because most of the parents, they used to hide their kids at home, not showing, you know, off, because they were scared of what people was going to say. Next. Then Smile Foundation came to our rescue. I met with Smile Foundation team, it was 20. 14, whereby I met with the psychologist for SMILE. By then, it was still, uh, I think it was Lerato. Lerato canceled the whole family. I was with my husband by the time we went. It was a SMILE week at uh, Chris Honey Baraguana, whereby they offered counseling. And we met up with the surgeons. And, you know, I felt relaxed because since from that day, Smart Foundation became my family. So then they didn't only assist me through surgeries, they assisted me through as well, financially supporting me through transportation to go for checkups, you know, for other clinics as well. So I always refer Smart Foundation as part of my family and believe me, I'm stuck with them. Um, also, a Gauteng Region Coordinator for Smile Foundation. The worst part and the worst highlight I had for Princess, it was when Princess did the surgery, it was the soft palate, which was done by Prof. Christophidis. It was after the I remember Princess went out from, she was crying and I couldn't even feed her, you know, she couldn't swallow anything. And when I look on her eyes, you know, and you could see that she was feeling pain and I felt like, you know, I had pain. But at the end of the day, we survived. I always recommend Princess as a strong 
young princess. And for myself, I always tell the other moms, if I did it, you can also do it. Hey, Sylvia, are you still there? We can't hear yes, you. Elena. Okay, I think she's ready for the next slide, Helena. Sylvia, can you hear us? Helen, she dropped off. I see she's coming back on now. Okay, sorry everyone, just a few technical difficulties, but I think Sylvia's trying to get back on with us. Is she back? Please remember just to put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat. I see there's some already popping up on the chat, so keep them coming. Sylvia, can you hear us now? Okay, you can unmute again and carry on. Sorry, you're still muted. All right, Princess, now. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but you keep coming and going. Okay. Princess now is in the process for dental, whereby it's been postponed due to this COVID-19. Uh, the only problem she's having now is the tooth on top of the gum with this protruding and disturbing her with the speech therapy. Okay, I think we've lost Sylvia again. She has not having a good connection there. So some of the questions just from earlier, I'll just use this time. We've, um, Prof has been answering them live um, online, but we can maybe just go through a few of those answers in case you haven't seen them. Um, just while we get Sylvia back. Sylvia, can you hear us? Okay, you're on, that's it. Sylvia? Yes, I can hear you much better. Can I continue? Yes, please continue. Yes, can I continue? Hello? Yes, okay, please Okay, I'm saying Princess now is in the process for dental. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, but it's a bit of an issue. Just keep talking. Princess is now is in the process for, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm saying Princess now is in the process for dental, whereby she's having problems with her speech regarding the tooth protruding on top of the gum there. So that big tooth is disturbing her, regarding her schooling as well. And also one other thing, other kids at school are teasing her because of the condition and that big tooth. So I have asked, can you hear me, Ilan? Yes, we can hear you. Please continue. Uh, princess is having a problem at school because other kids are teasing her regarding her condition and that big tooth there, and especially her speech as well there's a problem with the speech, but what I did, I've asked the school to help, especially headless teacher, to also intervene. Okay, we've lost um, Sylvia again. Um, I think we're gonna have to move on now. Um, and if we can just ask all the other panelists 
to just go off mute and just to go on camera again. And we can just go through some of the questions that have come up. Um, there's some new ones that have popped up on the chat. And it's about the issue that Sylvia was actually talking about now, the whole bullying issue. Sylvia, we've just, we're moving on just to all of the questions. And a lot of the questions that are coming up are about bullying. Um, and people are saying on the chat that it can be very difficult to deal with staring and questions being asked. And it's, it's, people are saying on the chat that you're very brave and people are very happy that you're able to find such support and to provide support as well to other mums. Um, there's some concern from a first time parent. Um, what are the, are they potentially going to have another, a child also with um, a cleft lip or palate? Um, and what is the procedure then about going for testing? Um, are, and the question about cleft lip and palate posing a high risk as Prof started at the outset, he said, not at a greater risk, but we don't know yet how, if they will be more affected by um, getting COVID um, when they're infected. So can I just ask Helena and Sylvia just to come in just about the whole tackling the bullying and, and that kind of issue, because it seems to be quite prevalent on the chat. Thanks, Helen. I'll jump in there. I think that um, from my own personal experience, you know, I thought my child not having had a cleft lip, he wouldn't battle with any sense of bullying. But you have to um, realize that children are children and they're going to bully somebody if they've got freckles, if they've got big ears, if they've got hair that's too red. Mm. Um, and for him, he actually had a, um, he, he came home one day and said, mom, um, the kids say I sound weird. And I had to just be calm and say, you know what, you sound nasal, but not weird. And then move on to actually give him the facts because he wants to know everything up front. And I appreciate that about, about him and his personality and who he is. So I didn't sugarcoat it. I said, these are the facts and how can we, you know, move forward. Something that I'm, I'm grateful for with um, our school is that they've got an open door policy. So we can speak to his teacher, to the principal, and they have an amazing um, life orientation program. They've actually brought in a, a psychologist who has, um, out, is rolling out an anti-bullying campaign in each and every class. Now, not every school is as privileged as, as what we are experiencing here in Port Elizabeth. Um, but I, I really do need to encourage parents to keep asking questions because you need to be able to speak to your kids, speak to your um, their teachers, just keep asking questions and you'll get on the right track. I'm not sure if anybody else wants to add anything. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Selena. Sylvia, can I ask you just to follow up in how did it affect you as a mum? Um, because it's one thing the child um, coping with bullying as they're a little bit older, but you as a mum, there's a question about how did you um, build your, your confidence and as a mother, just to help your daughter to have a positive self-confidence as well. Sylvia? Okay, we'll move on to another question for Prof. Um, there's a question, Prof, um, asking about what would the negative effects be on a cleft baby if you don't tape, tape them? I assume that means a cleft lip. They're, she's got a baby who's almost three months and they taped her in hospital, but she seems to struggle with her breathing. And that's why she was asking the tape question. So, and they taped her with brown tape. Is it going to make a huge difference if she doesn't wear the tape? Um, uh... I don't really want to answer um, no, it won't make a difference <laughs> um, because the reason why we tape um, um, the, the, the lip is because we're trying to not only get the lip slightly closer together as well as the nose, but we're actually also trying to direct the underlying alveolus, in other words, where the teeth grow from, uh, where the teeth erupt, we're actually trying to direct that um, in a better position because oftentimes it's not a nice um, sort of arch like this. Where the cleft is, um, you often get that scenario where the one is actually collapsed. And when we tape the lip in front of that, we are actually trying to direct that growth so that we can get a better um, arch. 
So it does make a difference. If your child is already three months, it's very close to the age where we would operate on the on the child anyway. And a lot of our children that unfortunately um, don't have access to taping and, and everything else are in that same situation. I wouldn't um, be, uh, if I were you, I wouldn't be in a situation where I would you know, throw my arms up in the air and give up. The lip repair itself is a slightly more difficult but it itself can be a permanent taping situation for the um, alveolus anyway. So if you haven't managed it, don't give up, uh, continue trying, um, and um, um, it will still be uh, a manageable situation in the end. But I do think that taping is a very cheap and effective way to do what we want to do pre-surgically as opposed to the very expensive manners and ways that um, they do things overseas. This has been shown to be very effective. So tr keep trying. If you're not managing, don't give up. Okay. Thank, thanks very much, Prof. Um, another question for you, um, it's coming up on the chat, um, is a concern of a first time parent, um, the potential risk of having another child affected by a cleft lip or palate. Um, and she's been asking about going for genetics testing. There is a, um, a message from Sister Merlin Glass, who is the genetic nurse counselor at WITS um, NHLS in Braunfontein. She's actually saying that there is, it's important for parents to have a genetic consultation if you are concerned and they'll take you through the family history um, and a clinical geneticist will examine the child, your child, um, just to exclude a genetic cause of the cleft in the case of, for example, a syndromic, um, when it's part of a syndrome. And she has put her details on the cleft, just to extend that, that there are other, a number of other genetic units around the country, including in Cape Town, um, at Stellenbosch, um, sorry, Stellenbosch University and UCT and the academic hospitals attached to those, in KZN, as well, of course, at WITS. And um, there is um, a unit in Bloemfontein as well. Um, but in addition to those, if you're located in any of the other um, provinces around the country, it is still possible to get connected, particularly through um, Clef Friends um, and that referral service. So I'd really encourage you to hook in there. Um, if I can just ask all of the speakers now, just to sum up, um, just sum up what you feel is the most important point in the context of this COVID um, pandemic that we're in the midst of. And as, a, as an inspirational um, last word to give to all the participants out there, whether they're parents, caregivers, patients themselves, or healthcare professionals. Can we start off with um, Sylvia, please, if you're there? Okay, I'm still here. Uh, during, this, during this period of COVID-19, it's so very hard. Yeah. You know, regarding the referral or uh, to the hospitals, because most of the surgeries are being postponed, and mothers will want to inquire and ask questions when are the surgeries going to be done. So, from experience, I know. Sorry, Sylvia, just switch off your video and we'll give it one last try with you. So hard. The only thing I normally share. Okay, Sylvia, we're losing you, I'm afraid. We're going to move on to Helena. I'm so sorry for these technical difficulties, but thank you, Sylvia. Helena, what would your last word be? I think um, that, you know, you're definitely not alone. I think that if parents can just keep asking questions, and we are here to empower parents and help point them in the right direction and contact us we, on WhatsApp's the best way to, to get hold of us. Okay, thanks very much, Helena. And then Prof, that your last word, please. Um, I mean, it's clear from this, um, this webinar that uh, there is a system out there. I think that um, having been, um, you know, over, overseas, having looked at and trained and, and seen all sorts of uh, different departments 
we, we do um, a really good surgical, we have a very good surgical approach to all our cleft um, operations. The only issue that we have in, in, um, in our situation and our setting is that we sort of a little bit overwhelmed with everything. And if we work together and if we try and um, give provider service, um, we, can, we can do it together. The only issue, uh, I must tell the parents that um, look at how much support you have out there. I mean, it's, it's magnificent and it's brilliant. So I really commend everybody else and uh, well done to everybody. I think this is fantastic. So well done to everybody and um, don't lose hope anybody. Just keep looking after your children. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Just, uh, it's just been clear that your passion has just come through and your commitment to helping others um, from your different perspectives, either as a healthcare provider or a patient or as a caregiver or as a parent. Thank you so much. And I just encourage you um, to actually to join up with rare diseases, whether you are a patient or a caregiver, and also seek out that help that is out there for you so that you can work together and just to know that you're not alone. Um, you don't have to sit there in isolation. Um, we will make the link available for this webinar along with the presentations and um, any questions that haven't been answered, we will make sure that they get sent to the um, panel for them to respond to. Um, but thank you very much for everybody that's joined us this evening and for all your participation. Um, it's been a real privilege to have such a caliber of speakers online and just keep the input coming. Send us an email, send the speakers an email and just keep this discourse going so that we can just keep up our momentum. Thank you very much and have a great rest of the evening. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.